Podcast. Presented by XFL2K.com. With your host, Tron Hawkins. Welcome to This is the XFL Podcast. It's your host, Tron Hawkins. Today, we're going to talk about the next team on our list of the team breakdowns, and that is the team that I believe will bring the XFL Championship home come 2020 to a city that's already won a Stanley Cup and a World Series Championship, and that is the DC Defenders. I love their team. I love what Penn Hamilton did. I want to talk about it here in this episode. I think them in Dallas is the you know clear cut top two teams. So I think I think they're gonna have a chance to beat Dallas. I think they're gonna win the East pretty handily, to be honest with you. Compared to the Vipers, the Guardians, and the Battlehawks. Battlehawks might be the top, you know, contender to go against them. That's who I think is going to go in the East Championship game is Defenders and Battlehawks. We'll talk about the Battlehawks uh, in a couple of weeks. But the Defenders, to me, has, the Defenders, to me, uh, for sure has the number two, I think, quarterback, or maybe even number three, according to how you rank them, uh, in Cardo Jones. Uh, a lot of people have him second behind Landry Jones, and I'll do my quarterback rankings list in a, you know, month or so. Uh, I have to have some time to think about it, but. Cardale is, um, a lot of people think he's going to be the star of the league other than Landry. Um, so I like what they did. I like their quarterback. I like their running backs. We're going to talk about it all here. Um, and I think Pep's a great coach. So I hope you all sit back and relax. If you're a fan of the Defenders, um, you'll enjoy this episode. If you're a fan of one of the other teams, um, you might not want to listen to this because I think this is the team to beat uh, in the inaugural season of the XFL. So when we first talk about the Defenders, we're going to talk about Pep Hamilton. Pep Hamilton... Um, was a great offensive coordinator at Stanford at, at uh, Indy with the Colts under Andrew Luck. So he knows how to develop a young quarterback. I think he's a good coach. He's the second coach ever hired behind Bob Stoops. I think he, um, I think he's long overdue a chance at, at being a head coach. I think he has what it takes uh, to bring a championship to the District of Champions. He remains to be seen on how he does as a head coach. All these coaches, you know, he's he's got some coaching experience. He don't have the coaching experience, you know, the head coach. But he does have more than some of the coaches do in this league when it comes to being a higher-end coach. Uh, he's got more experience than, say, Winston Moss. He's got more experience. Um, as, as not as a coach, but as a higher-end coach, like a coordinator or head coach. So I think that has something to do with him winning this. Um, he's behind, you know, Chessman and Zorn and some of them. I think he might be a better coach than both of them. Um, Stoops might be the only coach better uh, right now than him. Let's talk about their stadium. Um, I love Aldi Field. I think it's a great place. It's going to be a great place to watch a game. Uh, back when this podcast first started, I ranked all the stadiums, and that was number one. I think the 20,000-seat stadium, I think the smaller stadium will help. You know, the fans being right there on the field is going to be a great home field advantage for them. Um, I, I think that's why they picked them to host the first game of the season. It's going to look packed out. It's going to be nuts there for the first XFL game. And I think it's the perfect spot to play. And I can't wait to, you know, for the opening on, uh, three, on 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock um, on ABC against the Dragons. I can't wait to see the wide shot of all the fans there and how nuts it's really going to be in D.C. You know, D.C., they might take up the defenders as their, <laughs> as their team because the Redskins and their ownership's awful. You know, they ain't got nothing to be happy about. But with them, the defenders, a whole new team. You got a guy like Cordell Jones being there. You got Pep Hamilton. You got a pretty good offense and defense. This might be not only a football team in D.C., but the football team in D.C. So let's talk about their schedule. They open up the season week one, first game. Jim Zorn comes back to Washington on ABC against the Dragons. Going to be a great game. Silvers against Cardell Jones. And then a uh, rivalry division game, the New York Guardians come to D.C., also on ABC. Week three is when it's going to get kind of interesting. D.C. against L.A. L.A. is one of my favorites in the West, um, but they got to go to L.A. It's a uh, six, six, 6 o'clock game, you know, 3 o'clock out there. And it's a West Coast trip. The next week on uh, ESPN2, they go to Tampa Bay in a division game, and then a big one, week five versus uh, Battle Hawks in, in the Dome, the Battle Dome. They play them five weeks apart. I'm sorry. Week five, they play at D.C. Week 10, they finish the season at St. Louis. So I apologize about that. Week six is a preview of what I think is going to be a championship game. D.C. at Dallas. What a game that's going to be. Could be a, I think it will be a preview of the championship game. 
and then they stay um they play at, uh, against Dallas, excuse me, not at Dallas. They play at D.C., then they go at Houston. So back-to-back weeks, tough games against two of the top teams, I think, in the West. Then they play uh, the Vipers at home, and then they finish up the last two weeks on the road at the Guardians and at St. Louis. And they play a good bit of games. They play one, two, three, four, five games on ABC. So I think they're banking on them being just fantastic uh, team as well. Love, uh, love what they did with the schedule. I love that they open there, take your, one of your smaller stadiums and open it against a great team like Seattle. Uh, 20,000 might, they might pack it out, uh, week one with the DC defenders. Uh, right, now let's talk about the team a little bit. You can't talk about this team without talking about Cardio Jones. You know, Cardio Jones, one of those quarterbacks we thought maybe hopefully would be in the XFL, but he kept jumping around from practice squad to practice squad. Uh, there at the end, at the end of the training camp, then he finally got cut. Um, and I heard that he signed just a couple weeks before the season even started, or for the draft, excuse me. A lot of people thought that he wasn't going to be in the XFL. A lot of people thought that Landon Jones was the best guy, and he, and he might be, but Cardell is just biting on his heels. You know, he, he's had so much pressure on him before that he's used to it. He came in at the end of the 2014 season for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Won the Big Ten Championship, won the Sugar Bowl against Alabama, beat them. And then in the first ever college football playoff national championship game, they just stomped Oregon and uh, Marcus Mariota, who became the number two pick in the draft the next, the next you know, April. He went in there and he stomped them. Uh, now, he did have Ezekiel Elliott. He did have Michael Thomas. He had a good team around him. The crazy thing is he only started 11 games in college. He only had 11 career pass attempts in the NFL. So, I mean... That's a lot of excitement for a guy who's not had that much experience. Norm Chow was looking at him. Chessman was looking at him. But somehow, uh, the defenders ended up with him. He's six foot five, 250 pounds. He's actually pretty good mobility for a guy that big in the pocket. He's big. He has the traits of a NFL quarterback. He just never got a chance. And like Oliver Luck said on uh, Colin Cowherd's show uh, one day, he said that some of these quarterbacks like Philip River, Tom Brady, they just play forever. And these guys never get shot. And they think that Cardo Jones is one of the eight best guys that's not in the NFL. And I agree. Um, he signed with the Chargers and Seahawks this past training camp. Got cut. You know, he. I don't think he was ever... This is a good chance for him to develop. develop. In the NFL, he had 11 pass attempts in a, in a meaningful game. So this is his chance to show that he belongs. That he wasn't just a one-hit wonder. And I think he can do that. He's only 27 years old. But he's kind of just been treading water. You know, he's just treading water, kind of been in the same spot for years. You know, practice squad, that's practice squad, that's practice squad, that's practice squad, that's practice squad. So this is his chance to prove that he can be a star. And that even though he's only started 11 games in college, and only thrown 11 passes in the NFL, that he can do this in a pro league. I mean, Kurt Warner did it. Jake DeLong did it. I mean, why can't him? Why can't Cardio Jones do it? I think he's going to be a great quarterback. He's got a rocket arm, and I think D.C.'s put enough weapons around him to make him look like the star that he is. So the first pick in the XFL draft by the defenders, first overall pick in the skill position phase, was Rashard Davis. He was a superstar at the FCS level, but he was also a, a career gadget player. It went to his final year at JMU, that Davis broke out and was a game changer. As a senior, he played in all 15 games, making 12 starts. He set a James Madison record and a CAA single season record with four punt returns for touchdowns. He also had uh, 15 punt returns for 426 yards and four scores. He also tallied 42 catches for 530 yards and three touchdowns. He was named CAA Special Teams Player of the Year. Uh, he went undrafted but was signed by the Eagles. He spent 2017 season on and off the practice squad for the Eagles, but he did earn himself a Super Bowl trophy as his rookie season with the Eagles to go along with his FCS championship that he won in 2016. He made the practice squad again, only to be cut and then signed by Oakland. He would finish the year with the practice squad of the Raiders this past year. He was cut by the Raiders and claimed by the Chiefs, only to be released on cut down day in late August. The XFL board said that the fact that the FCS, the FCS, FCS player we're taking first overall since a strong statement. Cardell Jones was there in the D.C. draft room and announced Davis as the first pick. Hopefully it's a sign of many more connections to come between the two. This is one of those guys I've been talking about for a while now since the show started that can do everything. It's one of those guys that he, not only is he going to be a receiver, 
You can be a punt returner, a kick returner. You can do all kinds of stuff. There's going to be a lot of these gadget players in the league. Kind of like a Christian McCaffrey type, which we'll talk about in McCaffrey here in a minute. But kind of a type that can only run the ball, they can catch, they can do all kinds of stuff. The Swiss Army Knife players is what's going to make this league go around. Um, so I can't wait to see him play. Um, first game of the season will be him uh, going against that Seattle defense. It's going to be to see what he can do and if he lives up to that first-round pick status, uh, first overall pick status that the, that the D.C. defenders put on him um, back there in the draft. Trey McBride was the second pick out of another small school, uh, William & Mary. He was on a few NFL teams. He's been on five to be exact, but he was never broke through. He ran a four. He was a track star. He ran a four-three at six foot tall uh, and 210 pounds. He got drafted in the seventh round by the Titans in 2015. But he's one of those guys like like Davis is as a kick returner, punt returner, and a wide receiver. So we'll see what he does. Um, they also drafted DeAndre Tompkins out of Penn State. He ran a... 4 three forty at Penn State's Pro Day. The Eagles uh, jacked him. Uh, he, he, the Eagles selected him as an undrafted rookie, paying him $85,000 guaranteed to sign, which was the third most at the time out of, out of the NFL's undrafted free agents. He was cut by the Eagles this summer after battling a shoulder injury. In his career at Penn State, he caught 83 passes for 1,245 yards and six touchdowns. He was also a factor in a return game where he averaged 10.2 yards on 66 punt returns and scored two touchdowns. He wasn't a big receiving star in college, but is loaded. But he has upside. And then finally, the last receiver they picked, which would probably be the slot receiver, is Max McCaffrey, which is Christian McCaffrey's brother. Uh, he only had one career catch in the NFL, but that pedigree with his family's name should give him the opportunity to do good in this league. Uh, just with that name McCaffrey, it's considering who his dad and brother is, I think he might end up being a sneaky star for the defenders based on just that alone, his pedigree. Let's see if he can make make good on his name uh, come February. To me, I think the D.C. defenders had the best running back duos in the league. Jarrell Presley out of New Mexico, he ran a 4-4-40 coming out of college. He went undrafted, and he's been on five different NFL teams, but has never carried the rock in a regular season game. He joined the AAF with the Arizona Hot Shots. And not only do they have him, um, they also have Donnell Pumphrey, who was the all-time leading running back in college football history. He had a couple, you know, a cup of coffee with the Eagles, but never did anything. But those two together kind of like a thunder and lightning duo. Um, I think that he is going to be a, a stud. Uh, both of them will be studs coming out of the league, uh, coming out into the XFL, especially Pumphrey. He, I thought he had a chance to be number one pick in the whole entire draft just based on what he did um, in college. But those two together make the best running back duo. Like I said, a thunder and lightning kind of kind of deal. Um, I think that's the reason why I picked D.C. to win the championship is because those two together will be a um, will be just a dominant duo. Uh, out of the tight ends, the one that makes sense to me, the one I like the most, is Olsen Charles. He's a line blocker. He has played football in the NFL. He's also a John Mackey award finalist coming out of Georgia. He's a good, I mean, he's the reason why in the blocking scheme, he's the reason why people like Nick Chubb and Todd Gurley had good uh, careers with Georgia. Uh, he's a good blocking tight end. So I think they're going to use him as a blocking tight end for Pumphrey and for Jarrell Presley. So watch him, even though he's going to be a good catcher out of the backfield, watch him be the guy that be like a blocking tight end. When he's on the field, you're going to know that the defender's going to run the ball. Um, so watch for him be a, a dominant blocking tight end. There's an extra offensive lineman pretty much come week one. And then to me, the craziest pick was Tyree Jackson. I thought this guy had a chance to be a QB1, but he didn't. Uh, he got picked in the ninth round of the phase. He won the MVP and most outstanding offensive player in the MAC. The reason why I think this is an important pick is him. He and Ricardo Jones kind of have the same similar skill set. So if somebody, you know, if he gets hurt, Tyree can just step on in and be kind of like a like a Tommy Maddox and just dominate the league. They both have big arms, big bodies. So watch for if something happens to Cardell, or Cardell struggles, watch Tyree take over and just become a star in this league. We don't know if trade's going to happen or not in this league, but it's possible that um, if they are, Tyree could be a QB1 at some point. Maybe not this season, but next. So keep an eye on Tyree Jackson uh, for the defenders as the backup quarterback there. Um, in the offensive lineman stage, uh, the defenders picked Kyle Murphy first, but then he was signed by the Texans the next day. It says D.C. front office valued a player that is NFL worthy. So, I mean, it shows that they, the scouts for D.C. know his pro talent and they see it. Um, but they retain the rights to Murphy should he become available or cut again. That's the thing. While all these guys getting signed from the XFL, don't let it, don't let it forget, a lot of these guys are getting signed to the practice squads. Come the end of the year, they release all the practice squad players unless they resign them. So then they'll go right back to the, right back to the XFL. Probably before training camp even starts, or right around that time. So even though they got signed with the NFL, don't mean they're completely out of the XFL either. Uh, considering the league don't start until, you know, February. 
Logan Tully Tillman has never been lacking for talent, it says. The six foot seven former four star recruit landed at the University of Michigan had off the field issues as a Wolverine ended up transferring in college. Um and his pro career kind of got sidetracked with assault, but he's still young, kind of off a season of development in the AAF. DeAndre Wesley is a career NFL practice squatter. Mammoth's six foot seven, three hundred thirty pound tackle has had some injury issues since coming out of BYU. John Toth is a former All SEC center who's had stints in the NFL as a backup. Former UAB slash Colts undrafted Ricky Richard Cook follows the same theme of summer XFL cuts on the defenders. The thing about these guys is. They actually got an offensive lineman from Buffalo and an offensive lineman from Ohio State, which played in front of both their quarterbacks. But if you look at the guys on the D.C. defenders off of the line, they're huge guys. They're huge guys, which shows me they're going to want to run the ball with these huge. Don't be surprised if the D.C. defenders just run the ball a lot and do a lot of prey action with these large offensive linemen. I mean, with the two running backs that they got and these huge offensive linemen, it shouldn't surprise anybody that they're going to just run the ball down these guys' throats and just – destroy everybody at the running game. Uh, the main guy out of the defensive front seven I want to talk about is Scooby Wright. He played for Arizona State. He was an awesome player there, but injuries and stuff kind of kind of got in his way a little bit. Um, but I think he's going to be an awesome player. Could be the, like a defensive player of the year kind of guy for them uh, come February. I think it's going to be awesome. And, and he played with the Patriots. I mean, he just got cut by the Patriots on October 1st. And then, bam, he's an XFL player. The first pick of the this phase was James Valders. Uh, Charles, he played for the Bears some. Uh, Matt Nagy compared him to Khalil Mack. So, I mean, it's no wonder that that was the first pick uh, for the defense offenders. I mean, anybody that's compared to Khalil Mack um, should be a top pick considering what Khalil Mack's done. So, him him and Scooby Wright on the same defense is going to cause a lot of turnovers. For DC, and like I've been saying, they're gonna be. I think they're gonna be the type of team that will turn, cause turnovers and just run the ball. They're gonna play good defense and just control the clock. I think they're gonna be the, probably the most run heavy team in the league, considering how big the offense line is, who they got at running back, and who their defense is. They're gonna play uh, a really good smash mouth type of football, and that's why they're my pick to win this. Ball control is a key. The other team can't score if they never had the ball. Um, in the defensive backfield, they took um, corners with their first six picks of the defensive backfield draft. Elijah Campbell was their first pick. He's played for the Browns. Raheem Moore, who was the guy who gave up the uh, touchdown to Baltimore as a Denver Bronco. He was a first-round pick. Uh, I think maybe a second-round pick. But Baltimore ended up winning the Super Bowl because that. It, you know, he's known for that one play in time. He's not known for his actual NFL career. So, I mean, he, he's got a chance of not only redeeming his pro career, but redeeming that one play, that one play that kind of took away any chance he had of having a pro career again. I mean, he was enemy number one in Denver because of that one play. But he's got a chance to make up for it in, in the future. Tyree Kennel was four-star recruit and three-year starter slash team captain for Pam Hamilton's former team at Michigan. Thought that he went undrafted. Kennel has a good preseason with the Bengals, but did not make their roster in September. They also got Carlos Merritt, a ball hawking cover safety from small school Campbell University. That's one thing. This DC took a lot of small school guys, but Pep Hamilton's from a small school, so it kind of made sense with that philosophy that they went with. Not only did they get small school guys, they got you know recent NFL cuts. Dion Holloman, who had a 65 inch vertical leap from the Arizona Hot Shots, was one their biggest. I think their biggest. Open draft pick. Uh, they took a uh, f- former first round pick from Florida, Matt Elam, as a safety. He never lived up to his billing in the NFL. A combination of in- injuries, immaturity, and off the field legal issues ended his NFL run after four seasons. So they got talent there. They got pro guys on this team. They got a mixture of pro guys, guys that's been in the NFL, and they got these small school guys that never got a chance. I mean, that's that kind of mix you want. You want these pro guys to show these small school guys how it's done. You want them to kind of mentor them and kind of lead the way for them and i think that's why dc's gonna win this because they i think dc i think pep and them had a plan going into it and they executed perfectly with the quarterback with the offensive line with the running backs with the tight ends with every pick that they had they hit a home run on it in conclusion it says dc's draft stood out from the rest of the league's other seven teams that's not the state that was it was the best or the worst. Much like Dallas and Houston, the defenders draft had its own individual style and personality. The defenders leaned more towards player upside and measurables more than any other team in the league. The offense under Pep Hamilton, Tennant Engstrom, and Chris Skelefo should be very good. Look for the defenders to play power football and throw the ball down the field. Like I said, like a run the ball and play action. That's going to be the two things. Run, 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 and then big arm throws by Cardio Jones in play action. The team has... 
two very good, strong arm mobile quarterbacks who are built for outdoor football. On defense, it appears to me that DC may be leaning towards playing a 3 4 defense. Defense coordinator Jeffrey Fitzgerald has history of coaching in both 4 3 and 3 4 defensive systems. One of the coaches he worked under is Chuck Bagano. No shock to see defensive players who spent time with the Bears this summer on the DC defense. Bagano runs a base 3 4. There's no doubt that Fitzgerald leaned on his mentor for some intel on players. Two of the more important players on the roster is Rashard Davis and John Valders. They were drafted in positions that suggest that they will be elite players in the league. Valders is a pass rusher and Davis is a game changer. If DC hits on these two, let's do the quarterback. This team will be a serious contender. I think they are a contender. I see I see them winning the East pretty easily, especially with their record. Um, and I see them playing Dallas championship game. Just the two best coaches, well, two of the best coaches in the league is Pep and Bob Stoops. But I think DC, I think their rosters, which we'll get to every team, but I think their roster compared to Tampa, compared to New York, you know, I just, I just, and, and compared maybe to even St. Louis is better. I think they have the best roster in the East. And I think it's going to be, I think they're going to blow out the East compared to the West, who I think the West will be a lot closer. So I see DC running away with the East and I have them beating, um, I had them beating St. Louis, um, in the Eastern Finals, and then beating Dallas in the championship game. Thank you for listening. Sorry it took so long to get this episode out. I had a family tragedy I was going through. I'm going to try to put more out there. Um, it's hard to kind of make time <laughs> uh, to record with all, everything going on, but I appreciate y'all listening. I've been doing this almost a year now, and I cannot wait for the season to start. Check us out on our Discord, uh, the XFL Newsroom Discord. Check out xflnewsroom.com. Check out XFL un- uh, Newsroom Unhinged, the new podcast by XFL Newsroom. Just check everything out and enjoy it, and thank you for listening.